Chapter Thirteen of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen, Mount Whitney. There lay between Carson and Mount Whitney a ride of two hundred and eighty miles along the east base of the Sierra. Stage driving, like other exact professions, gathers among its followers certain types of men and manners either by some mode of natural selection, or else after a Darwinian way developing one set of traits to the exclusion of others. However interesting it might be to investigate the molding power of whip and reins, or to discover what measure of coachman there is latent in every one of us, it cannot be questioned that the characters of drivers do resemble one another in surprising degree, that ostentatious silence and self-contained way of ignoring one's presence on the box for the first half hour, the tragicomic, just audible undertone in which they remonstrate with the swing team, and such single refrain of obsolete song as they drone and drone a hundred times, may be observed on every coach from San Diego to Montana. So I found it natural enough that the driver, my sole companion from Carson to Aurora, should sit for the first hour in a silence etiquette forbade me to violate. His team, my strict attention to their duties, must have left his mind quite free, and I saw symptoms of suppressed social ability within forty miles of our departure. The nine-mile house, if my memory serves, was his landmark for taciturnity, for soon after passing it, he began to skirmish along a sort of picket line of conversation. To the wheel mares he remarked, Hot gals, ain't it, though? And to his off-leader, who strained wild eyes in every direction for something to become excited about, Look at him, Dixie, wouldn't you like a rabbit to shy at? With a true driver's pride in reading men, he scanned me from boots to barometer, and at last, to my immense delight, said, with the air of throwing his hat into a ring, What mountain was you going down to measure? Had he inquired after my grandfather by his first name, I could not have been more surprised. At once I told him the plain truth, and waited for further developments. But like an indifferent shot who drives centers on a first trial, he proposed not to endanger his reputation for infallibility, by other ventures, and withdrew again to that conspicuous stupidity which coachmen and Buddhists alike delight in. Left to myself, I spent hours in looking out over the desert and up along that bold front of Sierra which rose on our right from the sage plains of Carson Valley up through ramparts of pine land to summits of rock and ravines with shrunken snowbanks. So as far as Aurora, I remember little worth describing. Sierras, or outlying volcanic foothills, bound the west. About our road are desert plains and rolling sage-clad hills, fresh light olive at this June season, and softly sloping in long glacis down to wide impressive levels. Green valleys and cultivated farms margin the Carson and Walker rivers, Sierras are not lofty enough to be grand, desert too gentle and overspread with sage to be terrible, yet the pale high key of all its colors and singular aerial brilliancy lend an otherwise dreary enough picture the charm, as I once before said, of watercolor drawings. There is no perspective under this fierce white light. In midday, Intensely sharp reflections glare from hill and valley, except where the shadow of passing clouds spreads cool and blue over olive slopes. Alas for Aurora, once so active and bustling with silver mines and its almost daily murder, twenty-six whiskey hells and two vigilance committees grace those days of prosperity and mirthful gallows, of stock board and the gay delirium of speculation. Now her sad streets are lined with closed doors. A painful silence broods over quartz mills, and through the whole deserted town one perceives that melancholy security of human life 
which is hereabouts one of the pathetic symptoms of bankruptcy. The boys have gone off to merrily shoot one another somewhere else, leaving poor Aurora in the hands of a sort of coroner's jury who gather nightly at the one saloon and hold dreary inquest over departed enterprise. My landlord's tread echoed through a large empty hotel, and when I responded to his call for lunch, the silentest of girls became medium between me and a Chinaman who gazed sad-eyed through his kitchen door, as in pity for one who must choose between starving and his own cookery. But I have always felt it unpardonable egotism for a traveler to force the reader into sharing with him the inevitable miseries of roadside food. Whatever merit there may be in locking this prandial grief fast from public view, I feel myself entitled to, in a high degree, for I told it in my power to describe the most revolting cuisine on the planet, and yet I refrain. From Aurora, my road, still parallel with the mountains, though now hidden from them by banks of volcanic hills, climbed a long, wearisome slope, from whose summit a glorious panorama of snowy sierras lay before us. From our feet, steep declivities sloped 2,000 feet to the level of a wide desert basin, bounded upon the west by long ranks of high white peaks and otherwise walled in by chains of volcanic hills, smooth with dull sage flanks, and yet varied here and there by outcropping formations of eruptive rocks and dusky cedar forests. Just at the Sierra foot, surrounded by bare gray volcanoes and reaches of ashen plain, lies Mono Lake, a broad oval darkened along its farther shore by reflecting the shadowed mountains and pale tranquil blue where among light desert levels it mirrors the silken softness of sky and cloud flocks of pelicans, high against the sky, floated in slow, wheeling flight, reflecting the sun from white wings, and turning, were lost in the blue to gleam out again like flakes of snow. The eye ranges over strange, forbidding hill forms and leagues of desert, from which no familiarity can ever banish suggestions of death. Traced along boundary hills, straight terraces of an ancient beach, indicate former water levels, and afar in the Sierra, great empty gorges, glacier burnished and moraine flanked, lead up to an amphitheater of rock once white with neve. I recognize the old familiar summits, Mount Ritter, Lyell, Dana, and that firm peak with tightened strength and brow so square and solid it seems altogether natural we should have named it for California's statesman, John Connus. We rumbled downhill and out upon the desert, plodding until evening through sand and over rocky, cedar-wooded spurs, at last crossing adobe meadows where were settlements and a herd of Spanish cattle which had escaped the drought of California, and now marched, northward bound, for Montana. Frowning volcanic hills flanked our road as evening wore on, lifting dark forms against a sky singularly pale and luminous. Afar, we caught glimpses of the dark swelling Sierra wave, thrusting up star-neighboring peaks, and then descending into hollows among lava mounds, and found ourselves completely shut in. A night at the hot springs of Partswick was notably free from anything which may be recounted. Morning found me waiting alone on the hotel veranda, and I suppose the luxuries of the establishment must have left a stamp of melancholy upon my face, for the little solemn driver who drew up his vehicle at the door said in a tone of condolence, The hearse is ready. Stages, drivers, and teams had been successively worse as I journeyed southward. This little old specimen by whose side I sat from Partswick to Independence, ought to be accepted, and I should neglect a duty were I not to portray one, at least, of his traits. He was a musical old fellow, and given to chanting in low tones songs, sometimes pathetic, often sentimental, but in every case preserved by him in most fragmentary recollection. 
such singing suffered too from the necessary and frequent interruption of driving the same breath quavering and cracked melody and tossing some neatly rounded oath or horse phrase at off or near wheeler catching up and ended the refrain again in time to satisfy his musical requirements all the morning he had warned me most impressively to count myself favored if a certain bridge over bishop's creek should not sink under us and cast me upon wild waters rightly estimating my friend i was not surprised when we reached the spot to find a good solid structure bridging a narrow creek not more than four feet deep as we rolled on down owens valley he sang chatted and drove in a manner which showed him capable of three distinct yet simultaneous mental processes i follow his words as nearly as memory serves that creek sir was six feet deep what the devil you shying at you cursed mustang come up onto that little green grave yes seven feet we fell in swimming wouldn't have saved us you bailey what are you doing on the hill on the flowing vale and what's more we couldn't have crawled up that bank no how my own dear lily dale and you kick over them traces would you keep your doggone neck up snub against that collar and take that we drowned sir drowned sure as thunder in the place where the violets grow desert hills and low mountain gateways opening views of vast sterile plains no longer form our eastern outlook the white mountains a lofty barren chain vying with the sierras in altitude rose in splendid rank and stretched southeast parallel with the great range down the broad intermediate trough flows owens river alternately through expanses of natural meadow and desolate reaches of sage the sierra as we traveled southward grew bolder and bolder strong granite spurs plunging steeply down to the desert above the mountain sculpture grew grander and grander until forms wild and rugged as the alps stretched on in dense ranks as far as the eye could reach more and more the granite came out in all its strength less and less soil covered the slopes groves of pine became rarer and sharp rugged buttresses advance boldly to the plain here and there a canyon gate between rough granite pyramids and flanked by huge moraines opened its savage gallery back among peaks even around summits there was but little snow and the streams which at short intervals flowed from the mountain foot traversing the plains were sunken far below their ordinary volume the mountain forms and mode of sculpture of the opposite ranges are altogether different the white and inyo chains formed chiefly of uplifted sedimentary beds are largely covered with soil and wherever the solid rock is exposed its easily traced strata plains and soft wooded surface combined in producing a general aspect of breadth and smoothness while the sierra here more than anywhere else hold up a front of solid stone carved into the most intricate and highly ornamental forms vast aiguilles trim from summit to base with a line of slender minarets huge broad domes deeply fluted and surmounted with tall obelisks and everywhere the greatest profusion of bristling points from the base of each range a long sloping talus descends gently to the river, and here and there, bursting up through Sierra foothills, rise the red and black forms of recent volcanoes, as regular and barren as if cooled but yesterday. I had reason for not regretting my departure from the Inyo house at Independence next morning before sunrise, and when a young woman in an elaborate brown calico copied evidently from some imperial evening toilet pertly demanded my place by the driver adding that she was not one of the inside kind i willingly yielded and made myself contented on the back seat alone 
Presently, however, a companion came to me in the person of a middle-aged Spanish donna, clad altogether in black, with a shawl worn over her head after the manner of a mantilla. When it began to rain violently, and beat upon that brown calico, I made bold to offer the young woman my sheltered place, but she gaily declined, averring herself not made of sugar. So the donna and I shared my great coat across our laps, and established relations of civility, though she spoke no English, and I only that little Spanish, so much more embarrassing than none. In her smile, in her large, soft eyes, in that tinge of Castilian blood which shone red-warm through olive cheek, I saw the signs of a race blessed with sturdier health than ours, with snowy hair growing low on a massive forehead, and just a glimpse now and then of large gold beads through a white handkerchief about her throat, she seemed to me a charming picture, though perhaps her fine looks gained something by contrasting with the sickly girl in front, whose pallor and cough could have not meant less than the pre-tubercular state. Clouds covered the mountains on either hand, leaving me only ranches and people to observe. May I be forgiven, if I am wrong, in accounting for the late improvement of political tone in Tualme by the presence here of so large a share of her most degraded citizens, people whose faces and dress and life and manners are sadder than any possibilities held up to us by Darwin. My long ride ended in a few hours at Lone Pine, where from the hotel window I watched a dark blue mass of storm which covered and veiled the region where I knew my goal, the Whitney summit, must stand. For two days, storm curtains hung low about Sierra Base, their vapor banks, dark with fringes of shower, at times drifted out over Lone Pine and quenched a thirsty earth. On the third afternoon, blue sky shone through rifts overhead, and now and then a single peak, dashed with broken sunshine, rose for a moment over rolling clouds which swelled above it again like huge billows. About an hour before sunset, the storm began rapidly to sink into level fold, over which, in clear yellow light, emerged cloud-compelling peaks. The liberated sun poured down shafts of light, piercing the mist which now in locks of gold and gray blew about the mountain heads in wonderful splendor. How deep and solemn a blue filled the canyon depths! What passion of light glowed around the summits! With delight I watched them, one after another, fading till only the sharp, terrible crest of Whitney, still red with reflected light from the long, sunken sun, showed bright and glorious above the whole Sierra. Upon observing the topography, I saw that one bold spur advanced from Mount Whitney to the plain. On either side of it, profound canyons opened back to the summit. I remembered the impossibility of making a climb up those northern precipices, and at once chose the more southern gorge. Next morning, we set out on horseback for the mountain base, twelve miles across plains and through an outlying range of hills. My companion for the trip was Paul Pinson, as tough and plucky a mountaineer as France ever sent us, who consented readily to follow me. Jose, the mild-mannered and grinning Mexican boy who rode with us, was to remain in care of our animals at the foothills where we made the climb. I left a green barometer to be observed at Lone Pine and carried my short high-mountain instrument by the same excellent maker. Gauzy mists again enveloped the Sierra, leaving us free minds to enjoy a ride of which the very first mile supplied me food for days of thought. The American residents of Lone Pine outskirts live in a homeless fashion. Sullen, almost arrogant neglect stares out from the open doors, 
there is no attempt at grace, no memory of comfort, no suggested hope for improvement. Not so the Spanish homes. Their low, adobe, wide-roofed cabins, neatly enclosed with even basketwork fence and lining hedge of blooming hollyhock. We stopped to bow good morning to my friend and stage companion, the Donna. She sat in the threshold of her open door, sewing. Beyond her stretched a bare floor, clean and white. The few chairs, the table spread with snowy linen, everything, shone with an air of religious spotlessness. Symmetry reigned in the precise, well-kept garden, arranged in rows of pepper plants and crisp heads of vernal lettuce. I longed for a painter to catch her brilliant smile and surround her on canvas as she was here with order and dignity. The same plain black dress clad her heavy ample figure, and about the neck heavy barbaric gold beads served again as collar. Under low eaves above her, and quite around the house, hung in triple row festoons of flaming red peppers in delicious contrast with the rich adobe gray. It was a study of order and true womanly repose, fitted to cheer us, and a grouping of such splendid color as might tempt a painter to cross the world. A little farther on, we passed an Indian ranchero, where several willow wickiups were built upon the bank of a cold brook. Half-naked children played about here and there, a few old squaws bustled at household work, but nearly all lay outstretched, dozing. A sort of tattered brilliancy characterized the place. Gay, high-colored squalor reigned. There seemed hardly more lack of thrift or sense of decorum than in the American ranches, yet somehow the latter send a stab of horror through one, while this quaint indolence and picturesque neglect seem aptly contrived to set off the Indian genius for loafing and leave you with a sort of aesthetic satisfaction, rather than the sorrow their half-development should properly evoke. Leaving all this behind us, our road led westward across a long sage slope entering a narrow, tortuous pass through a low range of outlying granite hills. Strangely weathered forms towered on either side, their bare, brown surface contrasting pleasantly with the vivid ribbon of willows which wove a green and silver cover over swift water. The granite was riven with innumerable cracks, showing here and there a strong tendency to concentric forms, and I judged the immense spheroidal boulders which lay on all sides, piled one upon another, to be the kernels or nuclei of larger masses. Quickly crossing this ridge, we came out upon the true Sierra foot-slope, a broad inclined plain stretching north and south as far as we could see. Directly in front of us rose the rugged form of Mount Whitney Spur, a single mass of granite, rough-hewn, and darkened with coniferous groves. The summits were lost in a cloud of almost indigo hue. Putting our horses at a trot, we quickly ascended the glacis, and at the very foot of the rocks dismounted and made up our packs. Jose, with the horses, left us, and went back half a mile to a mountain ranch where he was to await our return. And presently Pinson and I, with heavy burdens upon our backs, began slowly to work our way up the granite spur and toward the great canyon. An hour's climb brought us around upon the south wall of our spur and about a thousand feet above a stream which dashed and leaped along the canyon bottom through wild ravines and over granite bluffs. Our slope was a rugged rock face, giving foothold here and there to pine and juniper trees, but for the greater part bare and bold. Far above, at an elevation of 10,000 feet, a dark grove of alpine pines gathered in the canyon bed. Thither we bent our steps, edging from cleft to cleft, making constant, though insignificant, progress. 
At length our walk became so wild and deeply cut with side canyons we found it impossible to follow it longer, and descended carefully to the bottom. Almost immediately, with heavy wind gusts and sound as of torrents, a storm broke upon us, darkening the air and drenching us to the skin. The three hours we toiled up over rocks, through dripping willow brooks and among trains of debris, were not noticeable for their cheerfulness. The storm had ceased, but it was evening when, wet and exhausted, we at length reached the alpine grove and threw ourselves down for rest under a huge overhanging rock which offered its shelter for our bivouac. Logs, soon brought in by Pinson, were kindled. The hot blaze seemed pleasant to us, though I cannot claim to have enjoyed those two hours spent in turning round and round before it while steaming and drying. But the broiled beef, the toast, and those generous cups of tea to which we devoted the hour between ten and eleven were quite satisfactory. So, too, was the pleasant chat till midnight warned us to roll up in overcoats and close our eyes to the fire, to the dark, somber grove, and far stars crowding the now cloudless heavens. The sun arose and shone on us while we breakfasted. Through all the visible sky not a cloud could be seen, and thanks to yesterday's rain, the air was of crystal purity. Into it, the granite summits above us projected forms of sunlit gray. Up the glacier valley above camp we slowly tramped through a forest of noble Pinus flexilis, the trunks of bright sienna contrasting richly with deep bronze foliage. Minor flutings of a medial moraine offered gentle grade and agreeable footing for a mile and more, after which, by degrees, the woods gave way to a wide open amphitheater surrounded with cliffs. I can never enter one of these great hollow mountain chambers without a pause. There is a grandeur in spaciousness which expand and fit the mind for yet larger sensations when you shall stand on the height above. Velvet of alpine sward, edging an icy brooklet, by whose margin we sat down, reached to the right and left, far enough to spread a narrow foreground over which we saw a chain of peaks swelling from either side toward our amphitheater's head, where, springing splendidly over them all, stood the sharp form of Whitney. Precipices, white with light and snow fields of incandescent brilliance, grouped themselves along walls and slopes all around us in wild, huge heaps, lay wreck of glacier and avalanche. We started again, passing the last two, and began to climb painfully up loose debris and lodged blocks of the north wall, from here to the very foot of that granite pyramid which crowns the mountain, we found neither difficulty nor danger, only a long, tedious climb, over footing which from time to time gave way provokingly. By this time mist floated around the brow of Mount Whitney, forming a gray helmet from which, now and then, the wind blew out long, waving plumes. After a brief rest, we began to scale the southeast ridge, climbing from rock to rock and making our way up steep fields of soft snow. Precipices, sharp and severe, fell away to east and west of us, but the rough pile above still afforded a way. We had to use extreme caution, for many blocks hung ready to fall at a touch in the snow where we were forced to work up it, often gave way, threatening to hurl us down into cavernous hollows. When within a hundred feet at the top, I suddenly fell through, but supporting myself by my arms, looked down into a grotto of rock and ice, and out through a sort of window over the western bluffs, and down thousands of feet to the faraway valley of the Kern. I carefully and slowly worked my body out and crept on hands and knees 
up over a steep and treacherous ice crest where a slide would have swept me over a brink of the southern precipice. We kept to the granite as much as possible, Pinson taking one train of blocks and I another. Above us, but thirty feet, rose a crest beyond which we saw nothing. I dared not think of the summit till we stood there, and Mount Whitney was under our feet. Close beside us, a small mound of rock was piled upon the peak and solidly built into it an Indian arrow shaft pointing due west. I climbed out to the southwest brink and, looking down, could see that fatal precipice which had prevented me seven years before. I strained my eyes beyond, but already dense, impenetrable clouds had closed us in. On the whole, this climb was far less dangerous than I had reason to hope. Only at the very crest, where ice and rock are thrown together insecurely, did we encounter any very trying work. The utter unreliableness of that honeycomb and cavernous cliff was rather uncomfortable and might at any moment give the death fall to one who had not coolness and muscular power at instant command. I hung my barometer from the mound of our Indian predecessor, nor did I grudge his hunter pride the honor of first finding that one pathway to the summit of the United States, 15,000 feet above two oceans. While we lunched, I engraved Pinson's and my name upon a half dollar and placed it in a hollow of the crest. Clouds still hung motionless over us, but in half an hour a west wind drew across, lifting the heavy vapors along with it. Light poured in, reddening the clouds, which soon rolled away, opening a grand view of the western Sierra Ridge and of the whole system of the Kern. Only here and there could blue sky be seen, but fortunately the sun streamed through one of these windows in the storm, lighting up splendidly the snowy rank from Kawea to Mount Brewer. There they rose, as of old, firm and solid, even the great snow fields, though somewhat shrunken, lay as they had seven years before. I saw the peaks and passes and amphitheaters dear old Cotter and I had climbed, even that Mount Brewer Pass where we looked back over the pathway of our dangers and up with regretful hearts to the very rock on which I sat. Deep below flowed the kern, its hundred snow-fed branches gleaming out amid rock and ice, or traced far away in the great glacier trough by dark lines of pine. There, only twelve miles northwest, stretched that ragged divide where Cotter and I came down the precipice with our rope. Beyond, into the vague blue of King's Canyon, sloped the ice and rock of Mount Brewer Wall. Somber storm clouds and their even gloomier shadows darkened the northern sea of peaks. Only a few slant bars of sudden light flashed in upon purple granite and fields of ice. The rocky tower of Mount Tyndall, thrust up through rolling billows, caught for a moment the full light and then sank into darkness and mist. When all else was buried in cloud, we watched the great west range, Weird and strange, it seemed shaded by some dark eclipse. Here and there, through its gaps and passes, serpent-like streams of mist floated in and crept slowly down the canyons of the hither slope, then all along the crest, torn and rushing spray of clouds whirled about the peaks, and in a moment a vast gray wave reared high and broke, overwhelming all. Just for a moment, every trace of vapor cleared away from the east, unveiling for the first time spurs and gorges and plains. I crept to a brink and looked down into the Whitney Canyon, which was crowded with light. Great scarred and ice-hewn precipices reached down 4,000 feet, curving together like a ship and holding in their granite bed a thread of brook the small sapphire gems of alpine lake, bronze dots of pine, 
and here and there a fine enameling of snow. Beyond and below lay Owens Valley, walled in by the barren Inyo chain, and afar, under a pale sad sky, lengthened leagues and leagues of lifeless desert. The storm had even swept across Kern Canyon and dashed high against the peaks north and south of us. A few sharp needles and spikes struggled above it for a moment, but it rolled over them and rushed in torrents down the desert slope, burying everything in a dark, swift cloud. We hastened to pack up our barometer and descend. A little way down the ice crust gave way under Pinson, but he saved himself, and we hurried on, reaching safely the cliff base, leaving all dangerous ground above us. So dense was the cloud, we could not see a hundred feet, but tramped gaily down the rocks and sand, feeling quite assured of our direction until suddenly we came upon the brink of a precipice and strained our eyes off into the mist. I threw a stone over and listened in vain for the sound of its fall. Pinson and I both thought we had deviated too far to the north and were on the brink of Whitney Canyon, so we turned in the opposite direction, thinking to cross the ridge, entering our old amphitheater, but in a few moments we again found ourselves upon the verge. This time a stone we threw over, answered with a faint dull crash from five hundred feet below. We were evidently upon a narrow blade. I remembered no such place and sat down to carefully recall every detail of topography. At last I concluded that we had either strayed down upon the Kern side or were on one of the cliffs overhanging the head of our true amphitheater. Feeling the necessity of keeping cool, I determined to ascend to the foot of the snow and search for our tracks. So we slowly climbed up there again and took a new start. By this time, the wind howled fiercely, bearing a chill from snow crystals and sleet. We hurried on before it, and after one or two vain attempts, succeeded in finding our old trail down the amphitheater slope, descending very rapidly to its floor. From here, an exhausting tramp of five hours through the pine forest to our camp, and on down the rough, wearying slopes of the lower canyon brought us to the plain where jose and the horses awaited us from lone pine that evening and from the open carriage in which i rode northward to independence i constantly looked back and up into the storm hoping to catch one more glimpse of mount whitney but all the range lay submerged in dark rolling cloud from which now and then a sullen mutter of thunder reverberated. For years, our chief, Professor Whitney, has made brave campaigns into the unknown realm of nature. Against low prejudice and dull indifference, he has led the survey of California onward to success. There stand for him two monuments, one a great report made by his own hand, another the loftiest peak in the Union, begun for him in the planet's youth and sculptured of enduring granite by the slow hand of time. End of chapter 13 Mount Whitney Chapter 14 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14. The People If mankind were offspring of isothermal lines and topography, we might arrive at a just criticism of Sierra Nevada people by that cheap and rapid method so much in vogue nowadays among physical geographers. Their practice of dragooning the free agent with wet and dry bulb thermometers would help us to predict the future of Sierra society, but little more securely than Madame St. John, who also deals in coming events. I fear we have no better than the old way of developing what lies ahead logically from yesterday and today, 
adding large measure of sympathy with human aspiration and faith in divine help. Why all sorts and conditions of men from every race upon the planet wanted gold, and twenty years ago came here to win it, I shall not concern myself to ask, nor can I formulate very accurately the proportions of good, bad, and indifferent dramatis personae upon whom the golden curtain of forty-nine rolled up. No venerated landmark or sacred restraint held those men in check. There were no precedents for the acting, no playbook, no prompter, no audience. Anglo-Saxondom's idea reigned supreme, developing a plot, a riotous situation, an inconceivably sudden change. Wit and intellect brought a condition the most ambitious savages might regard with baffled envy. History would not, if she could, parallel the state of society here from 49 to 55, nor can we imagine to what height of horror it might have reached had the Sierra drainage held unlimited gold. Those were lively days. The penniless 49er still looks back to them with bleared eyes as the one period of his life. Dust was plenty and to be had, if not for digging, at the modest price of a bullet. To prove the soil's fertility, he tells you proudly how, in those years, wild oats on every hill grew tall enough to be tied across your saddle-bow. This irony of nature has passed away, but the cursed plant ripens its hundredfold in life and manner. No one familiar with society, as it then was, feels the least surprise that Mr. Bret Hart should deal so largely in morbid anatomy or appear to search painfully for a single noble trait to redeem the common bad, yet not universal bad, for there were not wanting a few strong Christian men who amid all kept their eyes on the one model leading lives blameless if obscure. Broadly, through all kind and condition, shown the virtue of generous, if not self-denying, hospitality, a sort of open-handed fraternity banded together the honest miners. They were shoulder to shoulder in common quest of gold, in united effort to make the camp lively. The fraternity too often emulated that of Cain, or wore a ghastly likeness to the commune. That those desperados who, through the long chain of mining towns outnumbered respectable men, had so generally the fixed habit of killing one another, should rather be written down to their credit. That they never married to hand down lawless traits seems their crowning virtue. For a few years the solemn pines looked down on a mad carnival of godless license, a pandemonium in whose picturesque delirium human character crumbled and vanished like dead leaves. It was stirring and gay, but Melpomene's pathetic face was always under that laughing mask of comedy. This is the unpromising origin of our Sierra civilization. It may be instructive to note some early steps of improvement, a protest, first silent, then loud, which went up against disorder and crime, and later the inauguration of justice in form, if not reality. There occurs to be an incident illustrating these first essays in civil law. It is vouched for by my friend, an unwilling actor in the affair. Exactly why horse-stealing should have been so early recognized as a heinous sin, it is not easy to discover. However that might be, murderers continued to notch the number of their victims on neatly kept hilts of pistol or knives in comparative security long after the horse thief began to meet his hempen fate. Early in the fifties, on a still hot summer's afternoon, a certain man in a camp of the northern mines which shall be nameless, having tracked his two donkeys and one horse a half mile, and discovering that a man's track with spur marks followed them, came back to town and told the boys, who loitered about a popular saloon, that in his opinion some Mexican had stole the animals. 
such news as this naturally demanded drinks all round. Do you know, gentlemen, said one who assumed leadership, that just naturally to shoot these greasers ain't the best way. Give em a fair jury trial and rope em up with all the majesty of law. That's secure. Such words of moderation were well received, and they drank again to, here's hoping we catch that greaser. As they loafed back to the veranda, a Mexican walked over the hill brow, jingling his spurs pleasantly in accord with a whistled waltz. The advocate for law said in undertone, That's the cuss. A rush, a struggle, and the Mexican, bound hand and foot, lay on his back in the barroom. The camp turned out to a man. Happily such cries as, String him up! Burn the doggone lubricator! and other equally pleasant phrases fell unheeded upon his Spanish ear. A jury, upon which they forced my friend, was quickly gathered in the street, and despite refusals to serve, the crowd hurried them in behind the bar. A brief statement of the case was made by the C. Devant advocate, and they shoved the jury into a commodious poker room, where were seats grouped about neat green tables. The noise outside in the bar room by and by died away into complete silence. But from afar, down the canyon came confused sounds as of disorderly cheering. They came nearer, and again the light-hearted noise of human laughter mingled with clinking glasses around the bar. A low knock at the jury door. The lock burst in, and a dozen smiling fellows asked the verdict. A foreman promptly answered, not guilty. With volleyed oaths, an ominous laying of hands on pistol hilts, the boys slammed the door with, You'll have to do better than that. In half an hour, the advocate gently opened the door again. Your opinion, gentlemen. Guilty. Correct. You can come out. We hung him an hour ago. The jury took theirs next, and when, after a few minutes, the pleasant village returned to its former tranquility, it was allowed at more than one saloon that Mexicans'll know enough to let white men stock alone after this. One and another exchanged the belief that this sort of thing was more sensible than nipping them on sight. When, before sunset, the barkeeper concluded to sweep some dust out of his poker room back door, he felt a momentary surprise at finding the missing horse, dozing under the shadow of an oak, and the two lost donkeys serenely masticating playing cards, of which many bushels lay in a dusty pile. He was reminded then that the animals had been there all day. During three or four years, the battle between good and bad became more and more determined until all positive characters arrayed themselves either for or against public order. At length, on a sudden, the party for right organized those august mobs, the vigilance committees, and quickly began to festoon their more depraved fellow men from tree to tree. Rogues of sufficient shrewdness got themselves enrolled in the vigilance ranks and were soon unable to tell themselves from the most virtuous. Those quiet oaks, whose hundreds of sunny years had been spent in lengthening out glorious branches, now found themselves playing the part of a public gibbet. Let it be distinctly understood that I am not passing criticism on the San Francisco organization, which I have never investigated, but on committees in the mountain towns, with whose performance I am familiar. The vigilance quickly put out of existence a majority of the worst desperadoes and, by their swift, merciless action, struck such terror into the rest that ever after the right has mainly controlled affairs. This was, perhaps, well. With characteristic promptness, they laid down their power and gave California over to the constituted authorities. This was magnificent. They deserve the commendation due success. They have, however, such a frank, honest way of singing their praise 
such eternal, undisguised, and virtuous self-laudation over the whole matter that no one else need interrupt them with fainter tones. Although this generation has written its endorsement in full upon the transaction, it may be doubted if history, how long is it before dispassionate candor speaks, will trace an altogether favorable verdict upon her pages, possibly to fulfill the golden round of duty. It is needful to do right in the right way, and success may not be proven the eternal test of merit. That the vigilance committees grasped the moral power is undeniable. That they used it for the public salvation is equally true. But the best advocates are far from showing that with skill and moderation they might not have thrown their weight into the scale with law and conquered, by means of legislature, judge, and jury, a peace wholly free from the stain of lawless blood. An impartial future may possibly grant the plenary inspiration of vigilance committees. Perhaps that better choice was in truth denied them. It may be the hour demanded a sudden blow of self-defense. Whether better or best, the act has not left unmixed blessing, although it now seems as if the lawlessness, which even till these later years has from time to time manifested itself, is gradually and surely dying out. Yet today, as I write, state troops are encamped at Amador to suppress a spirit which has taken law in its own hand. With a gradual decline of gold product, something like social equilibrium asserted itself. By 1860, California had made the vast inspiring stride from barbarism to regularity. In failing gold industry and the gradual abandonment of placer ground to Chinamen, there is abundant pathos. You see it in a hundred towns and camps where empty buildings in disrepair stand in rows. No nailing up of blinds or closing of doors hides the vacancy. The cheap squalor of Chinese streets adds misery to the scene, besides scenting a pure mountain air with odors of complete wretchedness. Pigs prowl the streets. Every deserted cabin knows the story of brave, manly effort ended in bitter failure, and the lingering stranded men have a melancholy look as of faint fish the ebb has left to die. I recall one town into which our party rode at evening. A single family alone remained, too desperately poor to leave their home. All the other buildings, church, post office, the half-dozen saloons and many dwellings, standing with wide-open doors, their cloth walls and ceilings torn down to make Indian petticoats. If our horses and the great deserted livery stable were as comfortable as we, who each made his bed on a billiard table, they did well. With this slow decay, the venturous, both good and bad, have drifted off to other mining countries, leaving, most often, small cause to regret them. Pathos and comedy so tenderly blent can rarely be found as here. Enterprise is shrunken away from its old belongings. A feeble rill of trade trickles down the broad channel of former affluence. Those few forty-niners who linger ought to be gently preserved for historic specimens, as we used to care for that cannonball in the Boston bricks, or whatever might remind this youthful country of a past. They are altogether harmless now, possessing the peculiar charm of lions with drawn teeth. Behold this old-schooled relic, a type known as the real Virginia gentleman. As of a mild summer twilight, he walks along the quiet street, clad in black broadcloth and spotless linen, a heavy cane hanging by its curved handle from his wrist. He pauses by the saloon, receiving respectful salutation from a mild company of bummers who hold him in awe, and call him nothing less than judge. They omit their habitual sugar and water, and are at pains to swallow as stiff a glass and as neat as their hero. 
the judge is reminded of livelier days by certain unhealed bullet holes in ceiling and wall and recounts for the hundredth time in chaste language the whole affair and in particular how three-fingered jack blew the top of alabam's head off and that stopped it all we buried the six the judge continues side and side and it wasn't a week before two of us found old jack and his partner on the same limb and they made eight graves the ball that made that hole went through my hat and i traveled after that for a while till the thing sort of blew over ah boys he winds up in tones tremulous with tearful regret you fellows will never see such lively times as we of the early days his tall figure passes on with uncertain gait stopping at garden fences here and there to execute one or two old school compliments for the ladies who are spending their evenings under vine draped porches and when he takes an easy chair by invitation and begins a story laid in the spring of fifty the judge is conscious in his heart that the full saloon veranda is looking and saying the women always did like him the forty-nine rough too still stays in almost every camp he evaded rope by joining the vigilance and has become a safe and fangless wolf in sheep's clothing he found early that he could sponge and swindle a larger amount from any given community than could be plundered to say nothing of the advantages of personal security but now all these characters are god be thanked few and widely scattered our present census enrolls a safe honest reputable population who respect law and personal rights and who besides look into the future with a sense of responsibility and resolve it is very much the habit of newly arrived people to link the past and present too closely in their estimate of the existing status that dreadful nightmare of early years is unfortunately not to say cruelly mixed up with today i think this must in great measure account for the virtuous horror of that saintly army of travelers who write about california taking pains to open fire at sublimely long range with their very hottest shot upon the devoted dwellers here such bombardment in large pica with all the added severity of double letting does not interrupt the sierra tranquillity they marry and are given in marriage as in the days of noah regardless of explosions of many literary batteries nor is this peaceful state altogether because the projectiles fall short there are people here who read and read thoroughly can we think them hypersensitive if surprised when after opening heart and doors to scribbling visitors they find themselves held up to ridicule or execration in unimpeachable english and tasteful topography an equally false impression is spread by that considerable class of men whose courage and energy were not enough to win in open contest there and who publicly shake off dust from departing feet go east in ballast and make a virtue of burning their ships forgetful that for one waterlogged craft a hundred stanch keels will furrow the golden gate between the cruelly superficial criticism of most eastern writers and dark predictions from those smug prophets the physical geographers californians have nothing left them but their own conscious power not the poorest reliance in practical business like building futures one should say i am not going to deny that even yet there flickers up now and then a lingering flame of that forty-nine inferno if i did the lively and picturesque auto de fe of austrian george the other day would be moved to amend me we must admit the facts california people are not living in a tranquil healthy social regime they are provincial never however in a local way but by reason of limited thought aspirations for wealth and ease rise conspicuously above any thirst for intellectual culture and moral peace energy and a glorious audacity 
are their leading traits. To the charge of light-hearted gaiety, so freely trumpeted by graver home critics, I plead them guilty. There is nowhere that dull, weary expression and rayless sedateness of face we of New England are fonder of ascribing to our tender conscience than to east winds. So, too, are wanting difficulties of bronchia and lungs, which might inferentially be symptoms of original sin. Is Californian cheerfulness due to widespread moral levity, or because perpetual sunshine and green salads through the round year tempt weak human nature to smile? I believe it climatic, and humbly offer my tribute to the thermometer man, who among many ventures has this time probably stumbled upon truth. Let us not grieve because the writers and lecturers have not found Californian society all their ideals demanded, for, saving always the dry bulb readers of past and future, their dictum is confined to existing conditions. Have they forgotten that these are less potent factors in development than the impulse, that what a man is is of far less consequence than what he is becoming? Show these gloomy critics a bare stretch of vulgar Sierra earth, and they will tell you how barren, how valueless it is, ignorant that the art of any Californian can banish every grain of sand into the Pacific's bottom and gather a residuum of solid gold. Out of the race of men, whom they have in the same shallow way called common, I believe time shall separate a noble race. Traveling today in foothill sierras, one may see the old rude scars of mining. Trenches yawn, disordered heaps cumber the ground, and yet they are no longer bare. Time, with friendly rain and winded flood, slowly, surely levels all, and a compassionate cover of innocent verdure weaves fresh and cool from mile to mile. While nature thus gently heals the humble earth, God, who is also nature, molds and changes man. The End End of Chapter 14 The People Recording by Melanie Schleter McHelmont, Madison, Wisconsin On the web at melanie.mchelmont.com Dot org. End of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King.